Okay, welcome back to the Mighty Pod. I have Matt. He's in Prague right now. I'm not going to make fun of him to start the show. We are thankful that he's back. It's been since May 13th, which was three weeks ago that we actually saw him. So welcome back to the show, Matt. How are you? It started to rain on me. Oh, hell. Now. I think I need to move inside. Okay, well. It's okay. Just keep the recording. As we're still recording. As you move, tell us about BTC Prague. Tell us about the beautiful people there, the things going on. And then we'll jump into talking about the halving, BitGo, and a little intrigue with Ethereum firm consensus. So I would I would love to just honestly take uh, this pod from a, a mining segment to a bit of a traveler story because Prague is a, is a beautiful place. But I will I'll focus on the conference. Um, as far as conferences go, um, this is... It's probably the best um, conference I've been to. Um, it's BTC like ever. Yeah, and, and part of it is that we're not in um, a raging bull market, and so you don't have kind of a flurry of just um, really busy, compact, um, kind of fluffier conversations. People that are there are are interested in um, Bitcoin for a longer term, and that's where the conversations are centered around. The segments, um, I'll highlight two of them because I'm sure they'll come out on video. One was by BTC Sessions, who is a Canadian Bitcoiner that runs a YouTube channel that does a lot of kind of practical demos, um, often technical, on using different products uh, in the Bitcoin space to kind of help onboard you in a in more of a self-sovereign way. Example, like how to set up a multi-sig wallet or run your own node, et cetera, right? He was trying to run a donation campaign during the Canadian uh, trucker uh, kind of financial censorship that was going on about a year and a half ago. And he basically went through um, all the kind of mistakes that was actually made. He, he started it out by going through examples of how these truckers were essentially being censored by the banking system there. Bank accounts frozen um, were being targeted very explicitly. Uh, programs like GoFundMe failed, et cetera, et cetera. Bitcoin was really their only choice. But the thing with Bitcoin, as much as we say um, it's censorship resistant and it can be private, you have to know how to use it that way. And so um, he was uh, very authentic uh, and genuine about the mistakes that um, he made, how it would have changed. They did get about 70% of the Bitcoin donated to actual people during the rally. But you know, there was 30% that's kind of in uh, in escrow and in a, a court case currently that could have been prevented had he probably used the right tools. So it's a really interesting one, um, a reminder to not just, you know, talk the talk, uh, essentially. But walk the walk. Talks to Bitcoin, but use the tools, be prepared. Um, you never really know what situation you're going to be in. The other one, I'll be quick on this one. Um uh, a lady that works for the Free Navalny campaign. This was like a very uh, kind of touching story of how Bitcoin is actually used in a, in a humanitarian kind of human rights way. Uh, Navalny it was a sort of a candidate trying to go against Putin in Russia, trying to kind of take down a lot of the corrupt uh, cronyism that was happening out there. Was like completely oppressed, sent to jail, etc. And um, there's kind of a dissident group that formed off the back of that. They also went through all sorts of banking troubles and trauma and are trying to use Bitcoin to stop it. Also going through um, a set of, of troubles using Bitcoin, while it is helpful, that uh, we could all work on as a community to build better tools such that it is easier for people um, to use in a more practical practical way. That's it. I'm going to stop there. Um, be great. But it's good. It's good. I, I enjoy when conferences allow personal presentations and it's not all panels i don't know about you will but i find those more beneficial i'm not a big panel guy to be honest i think uh i don't think people on the panels even enjoy them okay let us go to some other stuff shout out to btc Prague. shout out to matt for being our foreign correspondent there today all the way from texas uh again we're gonna go back into the news so not a ton of mining news this week miners did release their public numbers so we will have a new report from anthony in the coming days for next week's newsletter that'll be dropping on tuesday give monthly production numbers uh, heading into the summer months we're already starting to see some important things like uh demand response numbers being pulled into uh miners for texas 
and then also still seeing a little bit of stuff with ordinals inscription. So looking forward to that report. For today, we're going to talk about BitGo, which has announced the uh, letter of intent to acquire Prime Trust. That's big for the Bitcoin space. Uh, then we're going to go into the Bitcoin halving talk. There's a nice piece from Coindesk, sort of like teeing up the conversation, going to the happening next year. Happening clock, everyone's going to be talking about that for a while. So I guess this is one of like the first thought pieces on it. Lastly, we'll go to our shitcoin cry corner with consensus, which is having some issues with some shareholders and people who work there early in the days and getting screwed over. So we'll go to the first story. Headline from Coindesk, crypto custody firm BitGo reaches preliminary agreement to buy prime trust that's according to sources this is a later follow-up up and confirmed by bitgo uh releasing a letter of intent this was a scoop from coindesk essentially the news and background here is that earlier in the week there was a lot of chatter on twitter from a lot of prominent vc types or founders in the space saying that a bitcoin custodian was about to go belly up everyone was speculating whoever that was speculation sort of zeroed in on prime trust which has a ton of different clients and has had some different clients in the space Prime Trust raised about $100 million last summer, July 2022. They had a bunch of different people, again, like Swan, Bitcoin, uh, Strike is one. A lot of people use this Prime Trust as their backend, uh, like they be able to a good product, a good customer service. But uh, from my understanding, there was a revolving door of CEOs. Uh, they laid off about a third of their staff in January, and they've also had to surrender voluntarily or involuntarily licenses to different states uh, for money transmitters. Those money transmitter licenses are really hard to get. And when you lose them, you lose customers, therefore revenue. So things started to look like they were unwinding. And there was a lot of chatter about, hey, is this the next company to go belly up as a custodian that could have larger implications than, say, just like an FTX going belly up. But BitGo coming in and buying them is interesting. I'll hand this to you in a second. Two thoughts on the BitGo, BitGo part. One, Bitco recently was involved in a deal with Galaxy Digital for Galaxy Digital to purchase them. That fizzled out and did not go anywhere after a while. Uh, we thought that was going to be a big thing in 2021, that the fact that Galaxy Digital was going to have all these different licenses and applications that Bitco has, but that did not happen. But now we see that Bitco is still Bitco is still kicking and they're able to buy Prime Trust. Second part, Bitco is a pretty important firm within crypto. Uh, probably the most notable product they have is Wrap Bitcoin, which means that you can take Bitcoin, put it on the Ethereum network and earn yield on it. It's a very popular product. I mean, it dwarfs any other sort of like Bitcoin denominated yield product in size. Uh, maybe BlockFi at its peak was like bigger. I'm not sure, but it's a very, very large product that a lot of people are familiar with. So interesting to see them step in and acquire Prime Trust. That helps Prime Trust like survive and continue to grow, hopefully in the future. Also adds a lot of power to Bitco. Okay, your take. Yeah, this is honestly a kind of example of what I was getting at during the segment on the conference where Bitcoin has all these amazing properties, but it only has them if you use it in a certain way. And I think this is a reminder that centralized third parties are security holes and that you need to understand your counterparty risk. Um, and in this, in this scenario, right, you had, nobody was detrimentally hurt because, um, I think strike Swan and, and other businesses kind of acted quickly and BitGo came in, um, to kind of save the day. But it's pretty clear that prime trust w was not in, um, a super, um, beneficial financial situation, right. And was kind of uh, needing some help. Um, and so the best way to hold your coins is to hold them yourself. Right. But there are um, a couple companies out there that also don't use um, third party backends as custodians uh, to name some and do your own research. But Cash App and River are kind of Bitcoin uh, only exchanges where you can purchase and they run their own in-house infrastructure. Again, that is also a counterparty in a, in a security risk um, that they are managing their infrastructure wisely. But yeah, I mean, I, to your point, Bitco is a very prominent company now. Wrap BTC has a lot of coins in it, um, hundreds of thousands, I believe, of, of coins in there. And now they're potentially also going to have coins from these exchanges. That in and of itself is a bit of a honeypot. And while they haven't had any reason in the past to make us doubt their ability to, to custody it wisely, it's just, just something to have in the back of your head. Definitely. And of course, this BitGo and Pride Trust News follows the announcements with Coinbase and Binance, right? Where... The SEC is going after both these companies. All that was documented this week. And I would assume that most listeners to the show have already sort of heard a lot about that this week. So 
there's some mining angles with this, especially with Binance Pool. We'll have to see how that shakes out, but we probably won't touch on it too much this week. Okay, two more stories. Let's talk about the Bitcoin halvening. We have a nice piece from CoinDesk. Uh, Eliza Gretzky talking about how the Bitcoin halvening is coming and the most efficient miners will survive. She details in this piece uh, basically about energy prices, expectation for where the price of Bitcoin could be at, where it needs to be at for miners to survive. Uh, sort, sort of details who are the strongest miners right now by uh, energy prices, how much they're paying per Bitcoin to mine. And it is important if you look at like all these public companies, which thankfully we have all this data on them. A lot of them are around like $13,000 to $15,000 per Bitcoin uh, as the cost of, to mine per Bitcoin. But then there's a grouping that's quite under that, uh, which would include Stronghold Digital, Cypher Mining, and Riot Platforms, which are a little bit below 10000 all the way down to like $8,000 per Bitcoin. So th their margin is almost always safe, and their margin was even safe back in November. The price of Bitcoin doesn't climb going to happening. Well, you could be in a tough spot because like your actual cost to mine Bitcoin could be almost at break even, if not worse. And a lot of these miners are like leveraged up pretty highly, uh, even right now, or they've been diluting against their stockholders. And if you're diluting against your stockholders and then you're not producing in your monthly revenue charts, then could be a bad time. Uh, for me, and I just want to get your thoughts on this, happening every four years is a big part for the Bitcoin industry. There's always like some sort of like festivals around it. And I think for miners, it's always the same story. You have to make sure that your budgets and your business are working correctly to go into it. For the rest of the industry, it's very different celebration, right? It's, it's more about like a celebration about Bitcoin. For miners, it's it's chaotic, it's frustrating, and it's a little scary. I mean, you covered it so well, but the, the strongest will survive, right? Who's the most efficient by your machines, right? Who has the cheapest cost of power? Where do you fall along the cost curve that is the mining industry? Um, is the question and can you handle um, a revenue cut? And, you know, the, the question is, and historically in the past, the Bitcoin price has responded very positively after each happening. Uh, the question is, will that happen again? Um, and that will impact um, partly which miners are going to be able to carry forward if they, you know, because most of them have dollar denominated liabilities and that's how they do their accounting. And so the Bitcoin price strongly matters. It will also be interesting to monitor the fee market and if Ordinals kind of progresses to be a block space buyer of last resort and kind of hold that threshold up and give miners more revenue on that side. Wow, way to be a shill for Ordinals right there. It's well placed. Yeah, Marshall Long had a nice tweet about this two weeks ago talking about uh, a lot of the minor decisions right now, summer 2023, will determine who's still in the industry next summer. So like minor purchases, hosting, energy contracts, things like that. So the next 12 months is going to be make or break. Uh, the reason being is difficulty is only going up, right? So you have to continue to compete. And maybe you can just continue to be extremely efficient and sort of eke out your living there. But for the most part, you almost always have to be continuously expanding, uh, particularly going into a happening and then seeing where the, the cards may lie. Okay, last story for the day. Did you read this one at all? The consensus piece? No, this is all you. Okay, it's all me. Consensus faces shareholder vote over controversial transfer of company assets. A lot of people don't care about consensus at this point. Uh, I think it's kind of, it's an older firm in the space. I believe it's founded around 2017 or even earlier, maybe 2015. Uh, it's founded by Joe Lubin, who's also co-founder of Ethereum. Consensus was basically this Brooklyn hipster hub where they're going to create a bunch of different architecture and code bases for Ethereum uh, in order to have people build on top of Ethereum. And they did do that. They built Truffle. I think they built Hardhat. So someone can fact check me on that. Uh, they built MetaMask, which is the, the go-to Web3 wallet. You know, millions in revenue per month, is my understanding. And they have an Infura too. Also in Fiera. So like, they built a lot of awesome stuff uh, that people in the Ethereum ecosystem do use quite a bit. The problem with it, however, is always been monetizing these things, right? Do you launch a token or do you just keep it in the equity? And there's also this dispute going into 2020 where Consensus was having a really hard time during the bear market. They didn't have a lot of cash. They were trying to raise money. And Joe Lubin seemingly pulled off some interesting business strategy decisions to re the company. I don't want to get too political here. There's definitely a lot of ideas on both sides about what this should look like. So that's that's sort of the reason I'm being totally 
touchy here because there's some people who think Joe Lubin completely ripped him off, scammer. There's other people who think like, no, he was, you know, running this business in order to keep it to survive. They had to like reformalize the shareholder deck and like protect the protect the whole company. Right now, that is being litigated in Swiss courts, just been back and forth between these OG consensus employees from back in the day who really started off a lot of these code banks and a lot of these products that have been successful. And then Joe Lubin himself and the consensus team as is right now. This is something that I just like continue to keep an eye on. Why? Because a lot of these products do matter for Ethereum. A lot of these products are like the first ones ever. A lot of people use these products. Most people use Infura at some point. Most people use MetaMask at some point. A lot of people, a lot of devs have used Hard Hat or Truffle. Uh, and so the fact that you know they built this and it might be broken up one day, or you might see the shares broken up in some different way, has like a lot of importance for the Ethereum community. Also, sort of tells you about like the history of trying to build these decentralized applications. It's really, really messy. Um, you know, we labeled this part of the conversation shitcoin cry corner and it really is for a lot of people who just got totally wiped out you know they spent years building this stuff and they didn't get to see anything from their the sweat and labor and that's sort of the tough part about building decentralized applications it's you might not ever see the benefit of what you're building because it's for like the common good so that's the story for the corner you don't know all the facts um in this one so it's difficult for me to have a very strong opinion but the bottom line um it, for me, is that Joe Lubin is a very important, strong character in the Ethereum story from the beginning as a founder and consensus spun out um, of basically the Ethereum foundation. It is, you know, maybe arguably the most important entity in the in the Ethereum space. I would probably put it at number two behind the foundation itself. Um, but having MetaMask and Infura are, are key infrastructural pieces to the Ethereum network. And at the, at the very bottom this is just you know a, a spicy story in the in the tale of ethereum and its history um and something that will be kind of fun to follow i agree gotta keep your eye on this stuff it's a tricky place to work in okay matt i gotta run that was a good conversation everyone listening thanks for doing so give us a like subscribe on youtube or your podcasting platform of choice send us an email at media at compassmining.io or just send one of us a dm if you have something to chat about or if you want to fact check us as well I actually like the fact checks. It's good stuff. Okay. See you guys next week. Peace. See ya.